If your water breaks, that means the baby is coming very soon. If only. Eating the placenta is good for you. No! Don't go there. Labor usually lasts a couple of hours. Perhaps the biggest myth that we will talk about today. Hi, I'm Dr. Laura Riley, and I'm a high-risk obstetrician at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Wild Cornell Medicine. My favorite thing to do is delivering babies. And I'm Dr. Dina Goffman. I'm also a high-risk pregnancy physician. I'm the chief of OB at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And today, we will be debunking myths about childbirth. Oh, this is good. Wide hips mean easier birth. This is a total myth. And what we see as your hips aren't even reflective of like right. what's going on with the bones in your pelvis, which do matter. The bony pelvis is connected by cartilage, which is softer, which loosens up in the course of the latter part of pregnancy. So that gives the baby a little bit more room. And then labor, all those contractions and the coordination that forces the head into the pelvis, a lot of that depends on the baby, right? I think one thing that is frustrating for people is they will say at 38 weeks, am I gonna have a vaginal delivery? We can't tell. Because there's so many other factors that go into whether or not your baby is coming out vaginally. It's not just the baby's size, it's the baby's position, it's how well the baby tolerates holding its breath every three minutes. There's more to the story. The best position to labor and give birth on is your back. That's a myth. What you might see on television or in the movies of a patient flat on their back is actually the worst position to labor and give birth in. We love to have patients be in bed, certainly on their side, but there's also a lot of opportunity to be sitting up and even to be walking around, depending again on the situation with your pregnancy, your baby and your labor. There's the opportunity potentially to take a shower. Some people use birthing balls as a place to sit. Many places now have have wireless fetal monitoring where you actually can even monitor the baby while you're moving around. And a lot also depends on whether or not you have anesthesia. Because once you have an epidural, it is fabulous for taking away the discomfort on your abdomen and those contractions, but it does in many ways weaken your leg muscles. So most hospitals will not allow you to walk around with your epidural in just because it may not be as strong. This is definitely a myth. You can induce labor by eating spicy food. So this is a myth. There are a number of them out there. All of the things that people think you can do to induce labor. Pineapples. Cream cheese. Bumpy roads. Sex. Um, sex. That one, there's so some truth to it, right? The nipple stimulation. Is, that's not a myth either. I know it's not a myth. Nipple stimulation actually does work. The tough part about nipple stimulation is that you get so many contractions at once that your baby doesn't love it. The sex and the nipple stimulation have sort of valid, plausible reasons why they may yeah. help, but I think there's not sort of a protocol for how to do it and how to do it safely. We know how to induce labor. We have different medications that we can use vaginally, medications that we can use in the IV, and we know how to do that safely. I think there is no evidence for spicy foods. Sex is fine if it's comfortable and something that you wanna be doing. Walking, being active, kind of getting out and about, but I think this baby's gonna come when the baby's gonna come. Your water breaks with no warning. I know people see it in the TV and movies and it's a very dramatic event and it's clear cut and you rush to the hospital and the baby is born, that's not always how it happens. Sometimes it does break with a huge gush and it's very obvious. Sometimes there is a leak and patients are unsure. And sometimes people don't know whether it's urine or it's their water breaking. If it's urine, it comes out and then it stops. And if it's your water, it continues. It does not stop. So put a pad on and if the pad is consistently wet and saturated, you have to think, gee, maybe my water broke. Sometimes we will break your water for you. For some patients, they will be in labor and progressing nicely in labor and the water will not have broken on its own. If you're unsure whether or not your water is broken, it's better to come in and let us tell you yes or no, rather than stay at home. Because if your water has broken and there's a long time before your delivery, you do increase the risk for getting an infection. If your water breaks, that means the baby is coming very soon. If only. Yeah, we wish. This is not always the case. It is all over the map. Because a lot depends on 
how many children you've had. If it's your fourth baby and you're contracting and your water breaks, it's coming fast. If it's your first baby, your water breaks, you're not contracting, it could be 12, 24 hours. So it's hard to know. Contractions that come consistently with the baby's head against the cervix are what makes the cervix open. The cervix has to get to 10 centimeters before you can push. So that process is the process of labor. If your water breaks in the course of that process, great, but that doesn't tell us the timing. For some subset of our patients, the water will break and the patient may not be in labor. That happens in probably eight to 10% of patients. So if you think your water is broken, you should call your provider and say, my water's broken, I am contracting or not contracting, and when should I come in? Because that answer is gonna vary depending on the circumstances around your pregnancy. Eating the placenta is good for you. No! Don't go there. Absolutely not. Please, please don't eat your placenta. Many patients will ask about the utility of eating the placenta. There was some suggestion that eating the placenta after birth might prevent depression, anxiety. And while we're completely supportive of doing anything to prevent those issues, I think we have to recognize that there's no science behind the placenta being helpful to that. There was actually a recent publication from the American Academy of Pediatrics that outlined some of these less traditional practices surrounding birth, and this one is specifically mentioned, and that paper calls out the infectious risk without added benefit. So we are happy to have these conversations to talk with patients through shared decision-making processes, but our recommendation will almost always be you should not eat the placenta. Instead of eating the placenta, it's really important to pay attention to your nutrition, your hydration, your rest when you can with a newborn, and lots of support from family and friends. Labor usually lasts a couple of hours. There are occasionally patients who've had children in the past who start to contract at home and come in and quickly have a birth with us, but it is definitely the exception, not the rule. It depends on how many kids you've had. Labor usually lasts, I'd say 12 to 24 hours is average for your first baby. Second, third, way faster. The labor process has multiple stages and phases. The early part of labor can take a fair amount of time. Some people will start with cramping, and then the cramping is like unbearable, and then they'll realize it's contractions. Those contractions then are maybe 20 minutes apart, and then they're 10 minutes apart. And you actually need a lot of contractions that are three minutes apart consistently to soften the cervix, and most people will do some of that at home for several hours, and then they'll call us and say, I think I'm in labor. And then we'll say, come on in. Once you get to sort of that six or so centimeters, things start to speed up, and then you eventually get to, you know, 10 centimeters, and then the real work happens. Usually you will begin to push shortly after you are determined to be 10 centimeters. And then that pushing process is called the second stage of labor, and it's from the time that you're fully dilated until the time that your baby is out. Once the cord is clamped and cut, then we go on to the next step, which is we need to deliver the placenta. We then are gonna do some things to help prevent you from bleeding. So that's sort of the last piece, making sure that we identify and repair tears that were created during the birth process. Doctors slap the baby on the back after birth. That's a myth. That's old school. And the movies. I think, I think actually, I was just gonna say, <laughs> I think it actually it's the movies. I think that, that it comes from the desire to stimulate the baby to take a big deep breath after we clamp the cord. But you don't really have to do that. The babies do it on their own. They start crying. So sometimes you will see us rub the baby's back or tap the bottom of the baby's feet just to sort of make it go, uh, and then it takes deep breath, coughs up fluid, and then starts screaming. An epidural increases the chance of needing a C-section. Myth, epidural does not increase the risk of needing a C-section. I think that misinformation comes from the fact that some patients probably get the epidural so early that they're not even in labor. And then it becomes intervention after intervention after intervention. 
And some people end up with a C-section. They'll explain the risks, they'll explain the benefits, and they'll explain the alternatives, which is always to not have one. But the risks that they will talk about are a tiny risk of infection and a very small risk of a headache after the procedure. Again, this is shared decision making at its best. It's great to have options for what you're going to use to manage labor because labor is painful. Get the epidural early before it's too late. That's a myth. Yeah, this is a myth, but it's a really common one that we hear. We wouldn't want you to get an epidural if you're not in labor. There really is no too late unless it's that the baby's coming or that you're unable to really sit still for them to place the epidural itself. I think it's our job to sort of work with you to figure out when is that just right for you and it may not be the same for every patient. If you show up and you're 10 centimeters and you're like, I want an epidural, I will actually talk you down from that ledge because it's not that you can't get the epidural. It takes about 15 minutes to get the effect of the epidural. So. 15 minutes into your 10 centimeters and pushing, your baby might be out by then. Have the conversation with the anesthesia team, even if you're not ready to commit. Meet the people, learn about the risks and benefits before you're in the active phase of labor, incredibly uncomfortable when it becomes harder to listen and process information. C-sections are the easy way out. Myth. Myth. You don't want a C-section unless you need to have a C-section. If you compare maternal risks associated with a vaginal delivery to a C-section, essentially everything is a little bit higher with a C-section. And what do I mean by everything? You have a greater risk of infection, a greater risk of bleeding, and a greater risk of having a blood clot after the delivery. And the recovery is definitely longer. The surgery itself is complicated. So we, in general, don't want you to have surgery unless there's a reason. You need to cut the cord as soon as the baby's out. So this is a myth. We've really moved towards something called delayed cord clamping, which means we deliver the baby, we place the baby on the patient's abdomen or chest. The cord is still connected from the baby's belly button to the placenta that's still in the uterus, and there's still blood flow going through that cord. And there have been studies showing that there are benefits to not clamping and cutting immediately if you don't have to. We keep an eye on the clock, we keep an eye on mom and baby, and then when the timing is appropriate, we'll clamp the cord and either cut it, but typically ask you or your support person or whoever else is participating in the birth if they'd like to participate by cutting the cord. It's harder than it looks. <laughs> and, and I do say that often to the support yeah. person when I hand them the scissor. Sometimes it takes more than one snip with the scissor to sort of get through that cord. It doesn't hurt the baby. That's another question I get all the time. Doing yoga poses can turn your breech baby. Have you seen any studies? I haven't seen good evidence that it's true. <laughs> if you're asking us, is there scientific research to say that no downward dog or the flashlight or the voices helps, I think the answer would be no. I think if you ask us, do any of these things hurt? I also think the answer is no. no. Um, as long as you can safely do a downward dog and yoga. I definitely find patients worried about it when they have an ultrasound at 28 weeks that the baby is breached. And they think the answer to that is that's totally normal. When you're approaching 37 weeks, and then is when we have to start having a conversation about how do we want to handle this breach. That's true, but there are plenty of times where the baby is breech at 37 weeks, you schedule a C-section for 39 weeks, and you come in on the day of your C-section and the baby's head down. So it happens. Kids are still moving and still quite active even after 37 weeks. Knowledge is power. Thinking about the labor process and the birth process, talking to your provider, getting a sense of the practice, the unit, what things are like there are actually really, really important to help lead to a really smooth, positive birth experience. I think that this is where the birth plan is helpful. Having some knowledge and knowing what you can expect, I think, just gives you a much better birth experience.